meeting. Well, hi once again, and oh, welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. I am excited to introduce you all to Melanie Tadeo today, and Melanie's going to tell her story. I don't want to give it all away, but Melanie has everything that we could ever expect to have in an Unstoppable Mindset podcast. She has a great story. She has unexpected life challenges that she has chosen to deal with, and she did deal with them. And she has all sorts of other things that I'm sure we're going to talk about. She's an advocate uh, dealing with persons with disabilities and all sorts of other stuff. And rather than saying all sorts of other stuff and then leaving it to your imagination, Melanie, welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. Thank you so much for having me, Michael. So here it is, a, uh, a late afternoon for me and an early evening for you. You're in Toronto, or well, in Ontario, right? Correct, yes. And we're out here in California, so we traverse the three major time zones of our two countries. And um, so you have you had dinner? Not yet. I will do ah. that. <laughs> I will start cooking after this is over. Well, let's get started. So... Why don't you tell us a little bit about you, kind of your your early years and all that stuff, and we'll go from there. Wonderful. So I'm the eldest of four girls. My dad is Italian descent, and my mom is Canadian, and a little bit of Irish and English in her background. But I was raised in an amazing, loving home where everything was encouraged. Reach for the stars, hard work ethic, possibilities, and be a great role model for my three younger sisters. And that sounds like a really comfortable life, but it could be challenging at times, of course, because, you know, you want to be that perfect daughter, whatever perfect was. But in your as a child, that's the impression it was given. Work hard. Of course, you had choices. Be a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> I didn't either, <laughs> but that's OK. But everything they had taught me was about equality and everybody is equal. Everybody, although there may be differences in our friends, all of us were the same inside and really to focus on that, not seeing differences. And I appreciate that now. Now, this was the mindset they taught me, yet in their generations. Disability. So how, how old were you when this was, was being taught to you? Oh, from age five. <laughs> up. So in school and so on, you were already thinking of people more as equal than probably a lot of kids did. Yes, definitely. And, you know, it's, it's, I'm so thankful for that because obviously we live in a very multicultural area of Mississauga and we, it was really great because, you know, although there were different heights, sizes, you know, different genders, all these different things. And of course, you know, different backgrounds, we just were all friends and that was a great mentality. And I'm really happy my family installed that in me at that age. Did other children have any kind of an issue with that? Did they tend to view people the same way? How did all that work? You know, it was interesting. I think looking back, reflecting back, perhaps there was some definite biases there. But as children, you just think, oh, they're mean. <laughs> and that was about yeah. it. And oh, I don't want to be their friend because they're mean. But it was never about, oh, you're this, you're that. But it was just that unconscious bias or the way that they were, they were raised. But we all played together. We all had great opportunities to learn about one another. And I appreciated that. Even individuals with disabilities, you know, there was a special class back then. I'm not going to age myself, but back then there was different separate classes. But they were just kids. There was nothing different, which I really appreciate that. My family always said, you know, no matter what family, you know, sticks together, we always work towards a common goal, set your goals high. Again, remember that lawyer and doctor kind of mentality. I, I reached for the stars. Everything I did in my life was to be a teacher because that was my dream. I wanted to be a teacher. I was that girl that set all her stuffed animals at the front of the room to teach them, you know, the ABCs. I loved it. So everything, my volunteer work growing up as I started to get older, 13 and up, was all right around kids. And I wanted to teach. That was my dream. So and when you were when you were growing up, um, did you have many friends who had any kind of disability? Do you remember? All. Not, not at all. all. Uh -huh. Not at all. <laughs> it was they were in different schools. Mostly yes. But for me it was just, you know, it wasn't even on my radar to be honest at that point. Uh-huh. 
Actually, that's not true. There was a young man down the street that lived and he had Down syndrome, but he just used to ride his bike around and he was just the boy, like we called him by his name, Jay. And that was that. But again, everybody was the same. <laughs> so it didn't dawn on me. But again, reflecting back, I, I now recognize that. But it was never said to me, oh, this person has Down syndrome. It was just, he was Jay. And it was a good thing because I feel it taught me so much about seeing past the disability. So that was right. early years. Great life. It was really great. So you went through well, I guess it would be high school and all that. And yes. you still wanted to teach? Everything. Actually, in high school, I, I got, used to, I got into art and I found my passion. I had a mentor in high school teaching me about art. And I was able to do all these beautiful paintings and drawings. And my creative side came out and I was on cloud nine. Uh, my mentor at the time said, I can retire if somebody, one of my students goes to university for art. I'm like, that's me. And again, <laughs> I did everything, working in art galleries, that sort of thing, just to get experience. And I put together an amazing portfolio and was accepted to go to university for art. Again, <laughs> it's a big joke on me in the future, but at this point I was living the dream, teaching art in summer camp and just loving my spare time was painting and drawing and really absorbing all the arts. So you went off to university, what university? I went to York University, which is in Toronto. Okay. So I, first I commuted and then I lived in residence and it was a great opportunity. It was very well known for their art program, top-notch professors and had great facility. And I was just experimenting with all the different uh, techniques and styles and just really trying to get my feet footing because I, in course, in our world would be an art teacher. That was my dream. Best of both worlds. So... I get the impression that something happened along the way to change all that. Yes, yes, it did. My fourth year in university, I started to develop migraines and everybody kept saying, oh, it's a stress from university. I'm thinking, I'm studying art. What kind of stress do you have throwing paint on a campus, really? And they kept giving me medication to numb the pain. But till one morning, I couldn't lift my head off the pillow. Finally, I said, there's something wrong. And I went and they did MRIs, they did CAT scans. They said, nope, nothing's showing. Until one day they saw something behind my eyes and they said, well, there's something there. And they diagnosed me with pseudotumor cerebri and really just means there's a fake tumor. Yeah. But it was a misdiagnosis. It was a sign of a stroke. So... They sent me for the eye operation to relieve the pressure from the optic nerve. And they kept me in the hospital and I was lethargic. I was throwing up and they said, oh, it's the anesthetic. It's this, it's that, it's the other. They sent me home and I was at my parents' house recovering and they had to go to the family doctor. And I had still been really, really sick and not well. And I couldn't see out of my eyes when I woke up. So they had them bandaged. And they said, oh, it's okay. It's part of the surgery. It's going to come back. And so I had to go to the family doctor for a checkup for them to test the eyes. And again, remem remembering that they said, oh, you're going to be able to see. Don't worry. Everything's fine. It's just they're swollen and they're going to come down. And I remember having to get showered. And I was like, come on, Melanie, get, get in the shower. And I said, okay, 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 just a minute. I sit on the seat of the toilet and just rest. Basically, my mom had to shower me, and I'm a very modest woman. I would never have let that happen, but I was just really out of it. Got to the top of the staircase, and my mom was like, okay, go ahead, go down. I'm like, oh, the house was spinning. And I said, oh, I think I'm going to go down on my bum. So I sat at the top of the stairs, and I started to go down, and mom was like, move your left side, Melanie. I said, I am. What do you think? I'm stupid. And I would never talk to my mother like that, but I had had a stroke at the top of the staircase. Hmm. So this stroke left me completely paralyzed on the left side and legally blind. So I was in a coma for two weeks. And I tell you, everybody, you can hear everything going on when you're in a coma. So please talk to us. I heard everything. I heard I had the last rites. I heard the doctors tell my parents I wasn't going to live to plan my funeral. I heard them basically say if I survived, I would be a vegetable. Of course, I also heard everybody's deepest, dark, darkest confessions. So again, be careful what you share. <laughs> My little sister came to me and said, I'm so sorry I stole your case of peach gum. 
because I kept it in my bedroom, you know, extra case, throw it in your bag every day. And when I woke up, I, I remembered everything. And so, of course, I would question them. But during the coma, my dad put a Walkman. And again, I'm dating myself, but with music on my ears. And I remember the songs from that time. And again, all of the DJs, everything was right there in my mind because I could hear everything and I knew what was going on. I just wasn't awake. So you actually were unconscious. Yes. Um, so it wasn't just that you were paralyzed and couldn't move. You were actually unconscious. But mm -hmm. as you said, you could hear everything. Yeah, I just couldn't communicate. And again, my brain wasn't there, apparently, supposedly. I was, you know, they kept saying she, she's not going to wake up. She's that's it. And that's a scary thing for a family to go through. But imagine hearing all this. I'm yeah. wanting to yell, at, hello, I'm alive. I'm still here. So yeah, it was a very exciting time to reflect on. But at that time, it was. And so when I woke up, I couldn't see anything. And of course, I was intubated, so I couldn't communicate either. And they kept saying, use this for that and use because I could hear. So use a thumbs up for yes, down for no. And they wanted me to use this bliss board of letters to point out and I couldn't see them. <laughs> I'm trying to explain to them, I can't see anything. And my eyes were no longer bandaged. And this was it. So when I was finally out of the coma, or sorry, still during the coma, they did life-saving procedure where they inserted a catheter into the groin and inserted 1 million units of blood thrown into my brain. And I was the second out of five in North America to survive. And that changed a lot because it, it relieved the blood clots, but it also added extra pressure to behind the eyes. So the optic nerves were permanently destroyed during this whole procedure. So yeah, I woke up blind, not able to move. It was a very scary time, a very angry time. So you were intubated. That must have been pretty uncomfortable, especially once you woke up. Definitely. I, you know, especially because you have to learn to swallow again, not only the stroke, but having this tube down your throat for so long. It was, it was just a very new process for me, having to digest everything that had happened, as well as recover physically. How long were you intubated once you woke up? So I was in the coma for two weeks, and I'd say right. that was going to be another two weeks. Wow. Yeah. My wife went through a situation in 2014 where she had double pneumonia and acute respiratory distress syndrome mm -hmm. and was put in an induced coma. So she was intubated. But after two weeks, they said they, they needed to remove the tube, but they did a tracheostomy so that she could, um, she could continue to breathe. But they kept you intubated for a month. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. And again, I, I'm sure, again, depending on the timing, how that works, because again, I had long term, uh, like they cracked all my teeth, all that fun stuff. So it was, you know, there's lots of other things. And then, of course, the raspy throat for quite a while. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. It was a scary so, time. So you were totally blind? Totally. Nothing at that point. Uh huh. And it was, you know, was it, it was, it was scary because I couldn't see, I could just hear people come in the room. I couldn't tell who was there. Of course, I got very used to people's voices and that was a good thing because that's how I tend to, you know, really depend on my sense of hearing, but I also only had use of one hand. So having to learn to do everything, feed myself, things like that, just laying in a hospital bed alone, but being told that I was never going to see again, that I was never going to get out of the bed, all those negative thoughts. And mm -hmm. I'm a very positive person. I always had been with that positive upbringing. And I kept saying, no, no, I, I, I'm, I, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. And they, they said, oh, Melanie, you know, stroke really affects you, know, your, the mindset of how you perceive things. And it's true. I understand that. So I always say I had stroke brain. It's not a medical term. It's a Melanie term that I thought I could do everything. I kept telling them this was happening in July. I'm going to university, going back to university in September. I'm going back to move out on my own. Yeah, I've got <laughs> pictures to paint. Exactly, exactly. Um, in my mind, I just wanted to get back to normal, whatever normal was. So what happened? Well, I, I'm a fighter. I'm a survivor. My parents will tell you I'm stubborn, but I like to say determined. It sounds much nicer. And after a good kick in the butt from a chaplain of the hospital, <laughs> I decided that I wanted to thrive instead of just survive. I stopped feeling sorry for myself. And, 
you know, there's a lot of time to think in the hospital. And, you know, I had amazing family support, whatever. They were petrified because, of course, going through that, I had regressed because I was scared um, to a little child call my parents, mommy and daddy again. And I just was, it was just part of the stroke and part of the fear. But after this chaplain really brought it back home, he's like, if you want to go back to school, you can, you know, you just need to really get your act together and work hard. And I went to a rehab hospital where I learned to walk, walk again. I don't have use of my left arm still, but that's because I'm right-handed and I kind of forgot it was there for a while. But I started walking again after, you know, driving my wheelchair into uh, the walls several times. They said they had to repaint the entire hospital, the rehab center, after I left because I kept, couldn't see where I was going. So I kept ramming into walls and things like that. But I just kept a positive attitude, got my independence back as far as I could physically walking first, of course, you know, with a quad cane, a single cane, and then without a cane. But then I had to come to terms with the fact that I was blind. I went through the denial. They had CNIB, which is Canadian National Institute for the Blind, come and see me with a guide dog and a talking watch. I'm like, what are you here for? I don't need you. Well, Melanie, you're blind. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and after I got through that denial, I went to CNIB and learned how to navigate, use my white cane, get around and cook independently and get my independence back. And then, of course, being stubborn, as you know, as my family would say, or determined, I went to teacher's college. I applied. And because my grades were great, my volunteer experience was right up that at, I mean, they had to give me that interview. And the interview went like this, Michael. How are you going to do this with your disability? And how are you going to do that with your disability? Of course, in my mind, I don't have a disability, right? I'm like, finally, I said, I thought this interview was about my abilities and not my disability. Oh, <laughs> well, they let me in. And my first day of teacher's college, my professor said, you'll be gone by Christmas. I said, watch me. I had no idea what I was doing. I'd never been to school without the eyesight. And I had to learn about books on tape, about having note takers, asking for accommodations. I knew nothing about this, mm -hmm. but I quickly learned. And teacher's college was only a year. It was intense. And even with my practicum, I had to advocate for myself. So I learned a lot really, really quickly because I was determined to achieve this dream. I wasn't going to let anything hold me back at this point because that was my lifelong dream. I had to learn how to do things differently, though, because, of course, I couldn't do it the same way. But you could do them. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> 100%. I got very creative. I, I was teaching a grade seven, eight split art. And I had these goggles created for the students to see what I saw. So they could understand just a little bit of what I was seeing. And it was the best teachable moment I've ever had. Those students could empathize. They got a really great ideas of what they could do, what they couldn't do, asked a lot of questions, which opens the dialogue for kids because they, you know, they're, they're they want to ask questions, they're curious, but they also are afraid of offending. And I was able to get them to try using doing art without their eyesight. You know, so I have them blindfold themselves, put some music on, okay, paint this. And it was a really great experience at the beginning. And as well, working with little kids, teaching them about abilities versus the disability because of course at that time when I was teaching in teachers college there was the differences and there was really hard differences with people with disabilities in the schools so they're being made fun of and stuff like that so I wanted to close that down fast so it was a great experience but the one thing I did face that was challenging for me is my professors thought that I should only teach special education and I, I fought that tooth and nails I ended up going into special education because I love it, but I was angry at them for putting me in that box. So you, when you were teaching art in um, teacher's college, what kind of art was it? Painting or sculpting? Painting, or... sculpting and drawing, believe it or not. Okay. And it was really getting them to teach the basics. And I had to teach myself, okay, how am I going to teach this concept now that I can't see? Because after I, when I was in the rehab hospital, they had me trying to paint and draw. And first of all, the drawings was to were totally disproportioned. So I thought, you know what? It's all about interpretation and perception. So why not call it abstract? <laughs> but I was still able, still having the skill sets to talk it through. So I would help them with a verbal Accuracy. okay, so we're going to you know, take the charcoal and do this and walk them through it. 
And I said, why don't you try and show me how you would draw this from your perspective? And then I would do a demonstration and they'd be like, oh, miss, that doesn't look like that bowl of fruit. No, it doesn't. You're right. What does it look like? But this is my interpretation. So it was a really great eye-opening experience for them. But I also really started to sway towards clay and sculpture and really get those tactile feelings. So for me, that's what shifted for me in my art, but I still had to teach the elements of art. So being creative, thinking outside the box and getting the students to really listen and be creative as well. So when you were teaching drawing and charcoals and so on, were you doing that in part because you still were going through some sort of a denial or? Absolutely. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> and that was so the you, thing to do, wasn't it? <laughs> right. Because that's that's what you teach in, in art, right? And that's the norm, right? Because I was normal, though. And it, it took me a long time to really understand. When I got to that acceptance stage, I was like, you know what? I don't want to do art anymore. And that was okay for me at that time. Since then, I've gone back to it, but in a very different way. So, but at that moment, it was working through the process of acceptance. So you were, you were totally blind. Mm -hmm. That, that did change at some point. It did. So I, it, it's, it's amazing. The brain is an amazing muscle, I'll call it. And so because my eyes actually are fine, it's the optic nerve that is destroyed. Yeah. My, my optic nerve wasn't passing the messages to the brain of what I was seeing. So technically my brain taught itself how to see. Not well, but I still I see some shapes and I see some details. I can read large print, things like that. So I do have some usable sight. However, I also learned very quickly not to depend on that sight because you never know. So, so how long after, well, you were in teacher's college, how long after that did you regain some use of eyesight? It was actually a number of years after teacher's college that actually came okay. back. Yeah. Okay. Did you learn Braille? I did. So you use Braille still? I do not. I, I, it's funny because I had, when I was doing my additional qualifications uh, to teach uh, individuals with, uh, with, uh, who are blind or partially sighted, they, they, you have to learn how to read Braille. So I mastered grade one like that. Grade two, the contractions, a little tricky for me, I'll be honest. But it was more visual. I was doing it because my fingertips are not so good with mm -hmm. the sensation. And, you know, of course, I can still teach it, but I don't use it myself. And I still depend on that large print or Sharpie marker. But I'm also learning about other technologies now to count on that instead of the print. You think your uh, fingertips and their ability to sense or read dots were affected at all by the stroke? I, yes, absolutely. Even though it was my right side, I, I definitely feel it was that. I noticed even though the stroke affected my left side, other sensations on my right side were diminished. So I think mm -hmm. that was definitely part of it. So that may have been an issue that if you didn't have a loss of sensation, that may have helped with Braille. Oh, 100%. And I think right. I would have definitely continued with it if it had been able to read it with my fingers because it is such an easy way to communicate and help with interviews like this. If you have notes or whatever, <laughs> it would be great. Yeah. Well, and, and it's important to be able to do that. And you're absolutely right. The, the reality is Braille is the main reading and writing mode that blind people and a lot of low vision people use as well, because in general, it's more efficient than looking at letters unless you have enough eyesight to read to be able to do that comfortably. Yes. And so the, the problem is that a lot of people, on the other hand, never get to learn Braille as children because they're forced to try to use their eyes. And I've heard just countless people say, if I'd only really had the opportunity and really did learn Braille as a child, I'd be a much better reader today. Mm -hmm. I've heard that a lot as well. And then also a lot of parents that don't want their children to depend on braille which i mind boggling <laughs> they don't want their children to be blind and they won't deal with that that's true too which is which is part of the problem but braille is still the the means by which we read and write but mm -hmm. you you certainly have dealt with it well and you've dealt with it in some some very practical ways since you really don't have the sensation to mm -hmm. do braille really well and that's perfectly understandable 
So you went off and you went to be a teacher. You went to well, teacher's college. And then yes, what did I, you do? I graduated as the first legally blind teacher to graduate in Ontario, which is a really big deal, except nobody would hire me. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, I really I struggled with that. I didn't comprehend why, because again, to me, there was no difference. It was just doing something differently and creatively. I had a lot of great uh, references, of course, because I was doing practice teaching at my old high school, I was teaching art, and of course I had references. But once I put my application out to the boards, I get calls from the principals and they'd be like, oh, you're exactly looking for, you know, grade seven, eight split for art, are you willing? And I, again, this is something I learned, but not to do, do not disclose your disability over the phone. <laughs> <laughs> before getting to the interview and I asked are you aware that I'm visually impaired and they said oh no and of course I said well was that a problem well not with me of course but I will be with <laughs> the parents <laughs> and again I wasn't a huge understanding advocacy at that point but to me who better to teach your children with a disability than somebody that lives with one just 24 7 right so I was like, okay, thanks so much. So I didn't get hired and I started to feel like, what a waste. Oh my gosh, I'm never going to get a job. You know, the whole poor woe is me, pity parade thing. And then it stopped and I thought, you know what? I'm a great teacher. I was still volunteer teaching and I was loving it. And I was coming up with really unique ways to teach and get around this, you know, safety thing. So I had all the answers down pat at how to do things safely for everybody and where I would be successful and what different things I could do to bring to the table to add that little bit extra. And I started to talk to people, a lot of people with various disabilities, and they kept saying, you know, we want to learn how to be independent. Melanie, how did you do this? And I said, well, it's easy. You just have to, you know, really put your mind to it, set some goals. And so I thought, wouldn't it be amazing to have a charity or a program. No, it was a, first it was a program to help individuals with different disabilities access education and training just as they are, despite their disabilities. And so I had run a learning center for adults with disabilities, just to teach them life skills, help them learn to advocate for this stuff, all the stuff that I had done to get my independence back. And that went on for three years and that was great, but I learned a hard lesson. Like, well, I'll use my own money for that. <laughs> Not a good idea. <laughs> So yeah. it didn't last long. <laughs> and I then I met a lawyer and they're like, why don't you start a charity to do the same type of programming? And that way you can seek funding and, and donations. Okay. So I did that. And in the meantime, I was trying to think outside of the box, other than life skills, what other skills should I be teaching? What other programs you're talking to different people? And advocacy was a big piece. And then also, I needed something to share information because I can't read brochures. And I was like, oh, you have to have a great brochure. I'm like, but I can't read it. So I, I created Voices for Ability Radio, which is the first 24-7 internet radio station for, about, and by people with disabilities as a platform for us to have a voice. And that was in Canada. So I want to be clear in Canada because there's many all over the globe. But And so Voices for Ability Radio was our platform for people to share their stories as well as those resources that... I and my family found so hard to find after becoming someone with a disability because nobody shared information. So this was an exciting journey that started in 2014 and we're still up and running and it's exciting. We now, since doing voices, learned that many people with disabilities love media. So I created a radio broadcast training program and how to podcast. So I teach that every day. It's a great thing. So I'm teaching just in a very different way. Well, and there's nothing wrong with that. No, not at all. I've always liked to teach. And when I was getting my master's degree in physics, I also got a secondary teaching credential. And in a sense, the actual certifications in both cases, um, I have not used. I, I didn't really end up with major jobs in physics, although I did and still do work with companies in terms of um, scientific technologies, bleeding edge technologies, and so on, and teaching by definition, because that is something that all of us have to do, as you're pointing out, 
the reality is we're the best teachers for teaching about disabilities or persons mm-hmm. with disabilities. Absolutely. And so it's important to do that. The other side of that is that we also, if we do it well, learn to sell. Well, we all become great salespeople because we have to do that in order to break through the misconceptions and perceptions that people have about us. Absolutely. So we we have to do that and, and make that work. So your um, the radio and the internet program is still up and running. It is, yes. We act now virtual because, of course, with pandemic, a lot of our clients are high risk. So we had them stay home during the pandemic and we were able to reach more people throughout Ontario. So for us, that made sense. So it's a 20 week program. We teach radio broadcasting, just the basics, introductory. They create their own podcast and a demo reel and a resume. And then we connect them. We partner with a lot of broadcasters. They come in and they they share their expertise and teach and we connect them with internships after they graduate and help them get their start. That's the starting point. Do you uh, teach them how to edit and, um, yes. and and process? What do you use for that? Reaper. Okay. Yes. Only <laughs> accessible DAW there is. <laughs> there And all the appropriate plugins and, and scripts that go with it. Yes, Reaper is a wonderful thing. Yes, it is incredible. And, you know, it's funny because it took us some trial and error. We tried Audacity. We tried all those other ones. It's just mm-hmm. like, I can't do this. They're not going to be able to do it. So, <laughs> yes, so Reaper yeah. it is. Well, I go back, talk about not wanting to give away your age, but hey, I'm not shy, nor am I modest. I worked in radio at a campus radio station in the late 60s and early 70s, actually up through uh, May or June of 1976. And I can tell you that there is nothing like when you need to edit a reel of tape cutting, splicing, putting splicing tape in, and doing it in such a way that you really can bridge the sound very effectively it is nothing like reaper today (laughs) yes it's amazing how far it's come the technology and again i can't even imagine how you did that that's incredible yeah i wasn't the best splicer in the world but i but i can use reaper really well so i'm very happy with with all the different things that one can do with reaper it is a great program Yes, and it it is accessible, and the reality is that it is possible to do editing and and so on. And Reaper is something that not only blind but sighted people use, but they have the people who are involved with it have been very diligent about doing everything possible to add in scripts and do other things so that all the features of Reaper are available and accessible. Yes, and it's so great because when we teach uh, our students with. Uh, who, who are blind we do with the shortcuts, but we don't do it just for them. We do it for everybody. It's faster, guys. Come on. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, it is. Well, this is great. I love that. And it's, it's interesting because it's amazing because everybody's on the same level. And we do do some extra work for those individuals with screen readers, you know, because we've got to make sure their JAWS key commands aren't the same and all those fun things. So, but it's, it's great. There are some great Reaper listservs, and most of the time is spent talking about doing things to create and edit music, and I don't use it for that, Um, and so I'm only doing simple stuff by relative terms, and that is for podcasts, but it is amazing the things that I see people doing and and all the things that we're learning and all the different things that are available. It's just pretty incredible. It is, it is, but I really appreciate the fact that they um, continue to update the accessibility with Osara and SWS. And there's even a, a group, I, I don't know if they're in Canada or they're, I'm not sure where they're located, but Reapers Without Peepers. And they're a group of young people that have all this expertise about Reaper. It's amazing. And they're a great resource for students. And, and that's where all the music stuff comes from. Most, well, I think the main proponents of it are in England or, or in the British Isles somewhere, okay. but it is all over. And there is a huge subscription list for the uh, for the Reapers without peepers. It's yes. pretty cute. Yeah, no, I, I think it's awesome. It's a great resource for our guys as well. So it's it's wonderful. It's a great experience. And I get to do what I love and watch individuals grow. And that's dream come true. So you're you're teaching them, but do you still have a radio program or any kind of uh, thing that you're my- publishing? 
I have my own podcast, uh, Take Another Look podcast with my co-host Gerda Felix, and we talk about uncomfortable and difficult conversations. So that's what I'm doing, you know, because you have to lead by example, of course. And if you don't have a podcast, and you're teaching a podcast, I'm like, how does that work? But I also, I did have a show on Voices for Ability for a long time. I just don't have the time to do everything. So I said, just take my content from the podcast and put it on the station. So we're going <laughs> to get to that. <laughs> Well, there you go. See, and yeah. the and the podcast is working well. How long have you been doing it? Since January. So oh, you're just you're you just newbies. started. Yes, we're newbies. It's interesting because we wanted to start something new and different, and working together is a lot of fun. And of course, we have we just recorded our twenty fifth episode, so it's exciting. You're doing once a week. We we yeah, they come out every Saturday. We, uh-huh. we meet together, we record two episodes and then just launch them every Saturday. Yes. Yeah. Well, we just are ready to put up show 37 of Unstoppable Mindset. It goes up on Wednesday and Ooh, uh, same thing. We're doing one a week and we started in September uh, and we're, we're pleased with the results. We've got a lot of people who listen and I hope that the people who are listening to this will definitely reach out as you get the opportunity to and let us know what you think of this, but we're having a lot of fun doing the podcast and hopefully we'll be able to teach other people the value of doing their own. It's all about telling stories, isn't it? It is really is. And it's what a platform to be able to share a story, to inspire others, to educate others. There's so many opportunities and really just have a conversation with the world about things that others don't know about. It's a great opportunity. And I've learned a lot from your podcast, Michael, hearing all the different guests and different perspectives. I think it's a great opportunity for everybody. So is Connect for Life still in operation? It is. It is. That's where I teach. So I teach through Connect for Life, the charity that I started. And it's great because not only are we doing the broadcasting class and the life skills class, but we also started up Intro to Public Speaking course. And again, for individuals with, uh, with you know, some difficulties with being able to see, confidence sometimes could be, but any disability generalized, but uh, so we have a, an introduction to public speaking course where we just teach the basics and get them comfortable and get them confident to be able to share their story because that's what advocacy is all about and be able to ask for things in an effective way when they need it. And then we also have our Connect for Wellness program, which helps individuals cope with their me- mental health, what's happening, with being isolated, lonely, having a disability, and again, talking about that so that they can get through anything they're struggling with. So in teaching public speaking, what's the most basic thing that you try to get people who are interested in becoming public speakers? What's the most basic thing you work to get them to understand or what what kind of things do you have to overcome? Uh, So first thing first is having a universal message that your audience can relate to. Your stories can be personal, but you always have to have that universal message. And please don't talk like this because it's really boring. Vocal variety is everything. <laughs> and for me, it's just about communicating and sharing stories, having that engaging connection with your audience. Because if you lose your audience right off the bat, they're not gonna listen. So it's that universal message, to tie it through so that what you're saying makes sense to people. And so that would be the main thing. But then, of course, you know, of course, enunciate your words, don't mumble, as well as to clearly outline your speech or keynote, whatever it is, so that you know where you're going with this and that people can follow easily. Those would be the main things. Read or speak from the heart and don't read a speech. Exactly. Yeah, and don't read. Don't read. Please don't read. <laughs> <laughs> because that's terrible. It sounds awful. But connect with your audience. Have a conversation. And that's exactly it. Speak from your heart. A lot of people speak best when it's off the cuff. When maybe, I maybe first started, <laughs> when I first started speaking after September 11th, a couple of people said, you should write your speeches. Okay, I wrote a speech. And I read it sounded horrible. <laughs> and I and I read it to the audience and it sounded horrible. They were very kind, but I listened to it because I like to record speeches and then go back and listen to them again yes. and find that I probably learn more from listening to speeches as well as going back and listening to these podcasts, which we do yes. as we're running them through Reaper mm-hmm. to yeah. take out any little funny noises and throat clearings and all that. But I find that I learn a lot by doing that. and. 
what I discovered was don't read a speech. Yes, exactly. And, and it's important. And the other reason which most speakers get locked into a mindset don't do is the value of not reading your speech. If you are at a venue where you're speaking and you get there early, you never know what you might learn that you want to put into the speech to add value to it. You got it 100%. And I think it's so important because I think, you know, what I learned is if you read a speech, you sound like you're reading a speech. You're not connecting with the audience and nobody knows what you've written. So here's the thing. If you know what you're talking about, just talk, have that conversation and connect with somebody. And like you said, you can add live and add things that just happen. So it can be more relatable to your audience because they were there for that instance, or perhaps they can relate to the topic because they're right there in the moment. But for people that are so focused on what they've written, they won't even go off script and they lose right. the opportunity. And how boring is that or what? Yes. And they always say there's three types of speeches. The one you wrote, the one you delivered, and the one you wish you delivered, right? Yeah. Wouldn't it be great just to deliver and be happy with that? Yeah, I work really hard to get to the deliver the one I wish to deliver. And so that's why I love to listen to speeches and so on and why it's so important to do. But I don't know whether I've ever mentioned it on Unstoppable Mindset. I was asked once by a speakers bureau to go deliver a speech to an organization called the National Property Managers Association. And I said to the speakers bureau person, well, what is that organization? already having my own preconceived notion of what it was, but they said what I thought, oh, it's an organization of all the people who are in charge of taking people's properties and renting them out and so on. So, you know, do you have stories that you can tell and all that? And I said, sure. Cause in fact, at the time that we were doing that, we had rented, well, we had given a property manager, a home, we were moving from one place to another. We were moving Southern California after Karen's illness and so we had a property manager take over that. And, and there were stories about that, not all positive. <laughs> but I flew in to deliver the speech and got there very late the night before I was supposed to deliver a breakfast speech. So I got to the event about 1230 at night, went to bed, got up in the morning, went down after taking my guide dog Africa outside because she has to go do her stuff. Yeah. So we went in to do the speech and it was breakfast. So I sat down and I was listening to some people near me speak and something sounded off. So I said to one of the people, tell me more about the National Property Managers Association. Exactly what do you guys do? And so on. The National Property Managers Association is an organization that is in charge of and responsible for anything physical owned by the United States government. Oops. Totally different. <laughs> yes. And I'm about 10 minutes away from speaking. Whole speech has to be revised. And I'm not saying that to brag, but rather to express the importance of really learning to be flexible. Now, as it turns out, I had negotiated government contracts and schedules and so on and had lots of great stories. In fact, it was a much more fun speech to give and did deliver a speech that everyone appreciated and got to also talk about things regarding disabilities and, and other things like that. But the, the bottom line is that if you are locked into something so much that you don't pay attention to what's going on around you, you're going to get in trouble um, yes. or you don't care, in which case they're not going to want to have you come back. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You would have got up and delivered your original speech and <laughs> they would have been yeah. like, hey, you know, what maybe. What the heck is that about? <laughs> exactly. And probably wouldn't have said much, but probably wouldn't have invited you back. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Exactly right. Exactly right. They would they would not have. But, but it was fun. Uh, it was a great event and um, enjoyed it and spoke to other divisions of it. So it was a it was a fun time. But I very much enjoy the fact that I believe it's important for me to learn more when I go to a speaking event than the people I'm speaking to, because mm -hmm. that will help me in future speeches. And it's all about speaking from the heart. And it's all about learning to speak 
And I can't even say extemporaneously because I know what I want to say. It's not Mm -hmm. like it's totally random, but I want to be able to be flexible. And that's what any good speaker should be able to do. Exactly. You know, uh, whenever I talk to my students about how do you memorize all your speeches? I said, well, I I personally, I write out my thoughts on on the computer and then I listen to it over and over again. I never ever go by what I write, but it's just the concepts I want to cover. And I may make point form notes as I'm practicing, but it's just a matter of listening to it. And then I just put them away and I just start talking. And that's the best speech when you start talking, (laughs) because I already know what I want to say because I've written it down. And that's part of how I learn is just by putting it down on something. And it could, and then I'll just walk around the house talking to myself. My husband's like, are you okay? Oh yeah, I'm just practicing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you're okay. You know, talking to yourself and it, it works out just fine. And sometimes again, you get up and you know, wait a minute. No, I'm going to say this instead. And it just happens. And yeah. it, that, in the moment. So it is a great way, but it's important. I find to teach the art of public speaking to anyone with a disability, because they've got to be confident in what they're saying, because they want to, we want, well, at least what I like to do is to ensure that people feel heard and valued and being able to articulate what you need and how, how you feel, things like that is very, very important skill that not everybody does because, oh, well, I'm just somebody with disability, nobody else will hear. Yes, they do. They need to hear your voice. So for me, that's why we do that course. Yeah. And by doing that, you're helping them to gain confidence. And and the reality is people always say, well, aren't you afraid to get up in front of an audience and speak? Because, well, I couldn't do that. I'd be afraid. And so I love to tell the story that after September 11th, the first time I was invited to speak anywhere was to a church service in central New Jersey, where they wanted to honor the people who were lost. So it was like two weeks after September 11th. So that would have been Well, it was the 26th. It was Wednesday, uh, two weeks and a day later. And I said, sure, I'd be glad to come. They said, well, you don't have a lot of time, only about six minutes or so, but we'd like you to come and tell your story. And I said, sure, I'd be happy to do that. Then I asked the big question, how many people will be there? About 6,000. So I learned pretty quickly, you don't be afraid of how large or what kind of an audience you have. Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> you yeah. can you can deal with them and it doesn't matter about the audience if you connect which is what you said earlier it's all about connecting with the audience and again knowing that they're there in an emotional state like you had just gone through and knowing that you can connect on that level you can connect by celebrating the first responders or whoever you were the fire you're celebrating and just really truly you're all there for a similar reason. And any conference, any speaking engagement, usually the people are there for the same reason, usually. But you, usually. Never, you never know. There's always that person in the audience you may yep. hit that may not know what they're talk- you're talking about or may really get something more out of it than you even expected. And one of the things I love to do after speaking is take time to talk to people, mm-hmm. to to meet with them and so on. Of course, it, it's a blessing to have a book that yeah. was a number one New York Times bestseller and and also have a guide dog because what we do afterward usually is, is there is a book table set up and I'll tie now Alamo, Black Lab current eighth guide dog um, and tie him to the table. Uh, Alamo knows how to draw in people when it's all about petting him, of course. Of course. But, but people come in and then we get to chat So whatever tool you have to use, but the bottom line is that people mostly really do want to interact. And, you know, I've spoken at events, if you talk about politics and so on, that are completely opposite in view from the political views that I have to, that I happen to have, but who cares is for me, it's not about politics. It's about, about speaking and and delivering messages. And one of the things that I generally do tell people is Look, I am perfectly capable and probably will pick on Washington, D.C. during this speech, but just let the record show I'm an equal opportunity abuser. Uh, I go from the standpoint of Mark Twain, who said Congress is that grand old benevolent asylum for the helpless. So they're all in the same boat. Yeah, (laughs) that's it. (laughs) So I said, you know, uh, we could we could pick on all of them and it's a whole lot of fun. 
Well, there you go. And again, adding humor and it just breaks the ice. It sets people at ease and they know that you're just here to share a story and then you're not going to get those people. Well, I'm on this side. I'm on that side. Right. You, yeah. you have that commonality. I love it. And, you know, a lot of people say, don't tell a joke at the beginning of a speech. Well, if if you're telling a joke just to tell a joke, then I agree. But if mm -hmm. it has a purpose and I have found some of those that are that are really very helpful to drive points home. So it's a lot of fun. Yes, absolutely. And that's exactly it. It's the right time, the appropriate time. You get used to where that is. And yeah, you know, it's it's just every speech is unique and different. Every audience is unique and different. So really knowing your audience ahead of time, the best your ability is a good thing. Even delivering the same speech at a lot of different kind of venues, each speech is different and it should be different. Mm -hmm. You have to tailor it, even though it's the same speech. Yeah. Even though it's basically the same speech, but everyone is different. And that's what makes it fun and also makes it great to listen to. Because when I go back and listen to some of those speeches and hear how audience react or don't, then that helps me improve it for the next time. So exactly. that's pretty that good. Feedback or the, the response or having those conversations after always gives you that feedback and you can just evolve from there. Well, with speeches that I give today, I've learned what I should be able to expect from an audience if I'm connecting with them. Mm -hmm. And if I'm getting those reactions, then I know that I'm connecting. And if I don't, then I'm on, well, on the fly, literally need to figure out what to do to make sure that I connect. And, and I've learned enough to be able to do that, but it is important to do that. And that's what a good speaker should do. Yeah. So you, on the other hand, in addition to speaking, have written a book. I have. Tell us about that if you would, uh, please. Sure. So my unforeseen journey, losing sight, gaining vision is my book and it was published in 2019. I, I had been told for years I should write a book. I'm like, who would want to read my book? And I was listening to an audio book over the Christmas holiday in 2018. I had received it. And I was mesmerized. I was telling my husband, oh, this is such an inspiring book. And he's like, that's why you need to write a book. I'm like, I asked him the question, who would want to read my book? He's like, you don't get it, do you? You don't understand how inspiring you are. So he planted a seed and I didn't want the book just to be about me. I wanted something tangible for the audience. So the book is about unforeseen change in our life and how we cope with it and some tangible resources for them to use um, for their own life. So everybody goes through unforeseen change, a breakup of a relationship, a death in the family, a loss of a job, um, let's say the pandemic. <laughs> And all of these things. But so the first part of each chapter is my story on a word. So it might be differences, beliefs, success, whatever the word of the chapter is, the title of the chapter. And then underneath, I give some things that helped me cope with it. And that way, the reader has the choice to add, try to apply it to their situation, or maybe it doesn't work for them. But I wanted something so people could walk away and go, wow, okay, now I can try this out in my life because these are the things that helped me. And it was such an amazing cathartic process to write the book for myself, but also had my book launch at the beginning of December, 2019. And I had planned this amazing book tour for 2020. And you know what happened. <laughs> you got to do it virtually. Well, this is it. I didn't actually do much of it, to be honest. I, I understand. Yeah, I, you know, I still will do it. I, you know, I've got all these books. And, but what was really great, we got to record the book, an audio version. My friend read it for an audio book. And I've been talking a lot about it with different things, but it was a great help in the pandemic. I had a lot of people say to me, oh yes. my gosh, I read your book. Can I order 10 copies for my friends? Because they need this right now. And who would have thought, I didn't know anything about the pandemic, but it was definitely a solution to coping with unforeseen change. We've just started writing a new book. I and a colleague um, are writing a book that we are, I originally wanted to call Blinded by Fear because people, when unexpected life changes come about, literally become blinded by fear and they can't make decisions. And it's all about learning to create a mindset where you can deal with unforeseen circumstances mm -hmm. and, and be able to move forward. 
for the moment that we changed the title, Carrie, my my colleague decided they are better titles. So right now we're calling it a guide dog's guide to being brave because I've had eight guide dogs. And so my whole life has been intermixed with dogs. So we're going to have a lot of dog stories and other things in it. Um, but the, the issue is that people really do need to learn that they can deal with fear and it sounds and deal with unexpected life changes. And it sounds like your book very much talks about that, which is it great. It definitely does. And it's interesting because I think we automatically assume, okay, it's, it's terrible life. Oh my gosh, how could this, I can't get over it, but mm-hmm. we all have that choice. And that's what I had to learn the hard way. That chaplain that came to me and said, Melanie, do you want to just survive or do you want to thrive? I'm like, ah, both. <laughs> but you, we don't always have that chaplain come to us. Sometimes we have, we're have we struggling on our own and not knowing where to turn. And I had to learn a lot of hard lessons and they weren't easy. So why not share? I wish I had had a book like this before this all happened. When you published the book, Mm-hmm. Was it self-published or did a publisher no, publish? I did partner publishing. And it's wow. interesting because I did a lot of research about publishing and I knew nothing about writing a book. Mm-hmm. And I, I go, okay, I could do the self-publishing. It's a lot of work. And what if it sucked? <laughs> <laughs> so I wouldn't know. So I went partner publishing and I had an angel publisher and she was amazing. I, I created a new language called Melanese so I use dragon naturally speaking to dictate Mm -hmm. the book and it doesn't type what you say not always (laughs) no not all the time so there was a lot of parts she'd be like um what did you mean here and then I'd have to go back okay this it's what I meant and so we we got through it but she was such a great help in creating the, the structure of the book and then helping with the editing and she's like Melanie like I wrote it within eight months. It was just because it was all in my my heart and my head. And it was just, I needed to put it on, on the computer and just get it there. And she's like, this is easy. It's not a problem. Just the deciphering of the Da Vinci code you've written for me. And, but it came out beautifully and exactly how I wanted it. And it was, it was a great experience. And, you know, of course, partner Fresh publishing costs money. So that's something that I learned now that I kind of know what I'm doing. I would definitely hire an editor. And maybe self-publish. Yeah, the thing about self-publishing is that you just have to be prepared to do all the marketing, but that's okay. Mm-hmm. And I did a lot of that with partners publishing as well. So it mm-hmm. was kind of like a half and half. So it was good. Don't think for a minute though that even if you create a contract and you actually work with a regular full-time legitimate publisher, don't think you won't be doing the marketing still because yes. More and more, they're expecting the authors to do a lot of the marketing. They do provide support and there's some value to it, but they do require you to demonstrate that you not only can market, but that you have a cadre of people to to help and that you have an audience that you can market to, which is cool. Exactly. And the thing is, who better to market your book than yourself? Because you know the story, you've lived it, you've written it. So to me, that makes a lot of sense. And yep. again, I think it, like you mentioned, after you do a speaking engagement, you have your book, you can talk about that, you can connect with people. And again, it's just making that circuit. And I still have to do a lot of that because I haven't had the opportunity yet. As the pandemic starts to hopefully cool down, we're hopeful, I'm optimistic. <laughs> uh, again, travel has become, again, something that we're able to do. And I, I hope to go and take it across, well, Definitely to Africa to where my husband is from. So we'll see how it works. Where's yeah. yeah. Now, where is he from? He's from Swaziland, which is okay. uh, just a little bit north of South Africa, close to South Africa. Yeah. So it'd be great to go internationally. Yeah. You joined Toastmasters along the way. I did. Really, when I started the charity. Tell us about that. Yeah. So when I started the charity, I knew I had to talk a lot about it and I'd have to talk to bigger audiences and be able to get my message across. And everybody said, oh, Toastmasters. I'm like, I don't need toast. I don't need to drink. I just need to talk. (laughs) And they're like, that's what it's about. So, you know, it really changed my life. I've met a lot of people and I've learned the fundamentals, the connections in the networking has been huge and a lot of great people, but it's given me valuable feedback and evaluation to help me grow as a speaker. It's international organization across the globe. Of course, I joined one club and then two and then three and then a four. And it's just 
you meet so many great people and you learn so much from other people. And now that it's international, of course, during pandemic, I was able to travel the world, going to all over the world to different Toastmasters Club. It's been a great experience. And um, so like, unlike Rotary Clubs and so on, if you don't do things, do you get fined? If you, Well, you do get fined occasionally if you misbehave or do something that you're not supposed to do in terms of speaking, right? Well, so with Toastmasters, it's more a learning process. So it's yeah. post. So it's not necessarily like a, a speakers bureau or stuff like that. Obviously, we have an oath and a promise. We promise not to do certain things as Toastmasters. But that being said, I don't think they would find. I, we, I was thinking after. more of. <laughs> I was thinking more of in past. They had an uh counter and you would. Oh, yes. Be oh, yes, yes. Absolutely. And, and when you got to so many, you had to pay a, a fine for having too many uhs and stuff like that. You know, it, yes, absolutely. The grammarian. So they definitely keep track of the filler words. And I try very <laughs> hard to work on that. Some clubs do collect money and then they do a party at the end of the year. Well, there you go. See, <laughs> others have the buzzer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> embarrass you. But it's it, but it's valuable because you need to learn not to do that stuff. Although I, I hear people occasionally now saying, well, if there's some filler words in there, maybe that's not such a bad thing. And I'm sitting there going, no, you're getting lazy. You know what? This is it. In everyday conversation, we do use filler words. Let's face it, but we, if we pause, it's yeah. powerful. And again, with my class, when I start to notice, you know, like so, and well, you know, <laughs> exactly. <I'm> like, <laughs> all right, let's count and let's see what we have at the end of the class. And they're all like, oh, wow. And then they stop and then they start again. <laughs> so it is a good thing to be mindful of for sure. I listened to a sports show several years ago. This guy liked to pick on some athletes and he was interviewing one athlete. And when they broadcast the interview, he pointed out that this guy in a minute and a half said, you know, 48 times, <laughs> which Goodness was, gracious. <laughs> I know I'm sitting there going, wow, but, but he played the interview and they were there, you yes, know, and, that's so, exactly it. and you want to make sure that, and we kept them. And I will say, one of my clubs is really, really bad for them. And I'm like, okay, guys, I stopped counting at 100. Please stop. <laughs> it's, it, it, that's a two hour meeting, but still, you, you get my point. I do. So you got to be quite the advocate. And again, now dealing with persons with disabilities and so on. And I know that we've been doing this a while and we're getting close to the the time that we should wrap it up. But that's the beauty of a podcast. We don't have to be right on time in that sense. But how, how do you find dealing with laws in Canada? Because a lot of times what I've, at least in my experience, found that laws are more provincial rather than across all, all of the provinces. And that gets to be a challenge. It does. It does. So in Ontario, we have the AODA, the Accessibility, Accessibility, oh my gosh, Accessibility of Ontario's Disability Act. And we really, truly have Great standards. It's wonderful. We're not quite there. A lot of work still to do, but it is an effort. But then if you go to a different province, it's different. Yeah. So I know they are working on federal legislation. But I will say, since I acquired my disability 26 years ago, I've seen leaps and bounds with accessibility for buildings, yes. or built environment, even for information and uh, technology, definitely has come far. We're still not there. The websites are not accessible. <laughs> We're getting there. But it's now not necessarily afterthought. It started to be part of the process, which I appreciate. So I will say we have definitely come a far distance, still far distance to go. But I will continue to advocate for accessibility and for inclusion as we go, because that's something I'm passionate about. And I know we can get there. We can get there. And it is a process. You use Accessibility on your website? I your, do on Connect yeah. Life. And I'm getting it now on all of my personal websites. So I'm so excited. And the point is that Accessibility is a representation of how the process is changing. And it's an evolutionary process and it will improve over time. I remember dating me again, being involved in the original project of the National Federation of the Blind and Ray Kurzweil in 1976, where we took several of his 400 pound machines and put them in various places around the United States 
to get input from blind people as to what they would like to see improved in the machine and so on. And when I think about it, those machines were horrible at reading, but at the time they weren't. Yes, there were a lot of mistakes. And when you compare it with the standards of today, there were a lot of problems, but still most people recognized, yeah, it's not perfect. Yeah. There's a lot. It doesn't read, but gee, I can read stuff I never could before. And there was always the recognition and the promise that improvements were coming and look at optical character recognition today, which yes. really did start from an Omnifont standpoint with Ray Kurzweil. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to see the evolution. And again, it's a matter of just getting that feedback from the users because that's who needs to really give that feedback and software manufacturers to listen and to make those switches and changes. I, I can tell you, Siri and I have this love-hate relationship on my iPhone. I love it. <laughs> but she never types what I say. <laughs> well, and um, my Amazon Echo doesn't understand a lot of the questions that I ask, mm -hmm. which is another story. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, this has been fun, Melanie, and I really enjoyed you being on Unstoppable Mindset. And I would love it if you would tell people how they can reach out to you and communicate with you. And please tell us about where we can get your books. Oh, thank you so much. So everybody uh, can reach out to me, uh, my website, Melanie Tadeo, um, E-L-A-N-I-E-T-A-D-D-E-O dot C-A. Uh, my books are also available on Amazon through that website. And again, they can contact me directly. And that's Melanie at connect the number four life dot C-A. And again, I'd be happy to ship the book to you. Or if you'd like an audio book or ebook, let me know and I can just email it to you. So again, there's lots of methods to connect that way. And then of course I have my Gaining Vision website, which is gainingvision2020.com and my take another look podcast.com website. So there's lots of ways to connect. Please do reach well, out. And I hope people will listen to your podcast and subscribe. That would Please. that would be great. We're just starting. We're on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, so we're, we're and YouTube. But please definitely uh, reach out. We'd love to hear from you. We're always looking for guests as well. So if anybody wants to have an uncomfortable or difficult conversation, let me know. I'll volunteer. Yes. Oh, don't you worry. I'm hitting <laughs> you up, Michael. <laughs> huh? Don't worry. I'm, I'm hitting you up for that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I just said it publicly. There you go. Perfect. Well, well, thanks for joining us on Unstoppable Mindset, and I hope. All of you listening have enjoyed this. Please reach out to Melanie, and I want to hear from you as well. So wherever you're listening to this podcast, first, please give us a five-star rating. We appreciate that. You can reach me at michaelhi at accessibe.com, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I at accessibe, A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E.com, or go to our podcast page, which is www.michaelhingson, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I-N-G-S-O-N.com slash podcast. And again, please give us a great rating. Please tell your friends about the podcast. So they'll come back and listen to Melanie and reach out to her as well. Whether they're in Canada or the United States, Melanie has a lot to offer. No question about it. So Please reach out to her and we hope to hear from you all again too in the near future the next time we have another episode. And again, Melanie, thanks very much for being here. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun.